poppin' is your boy Mike Powers. The, 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 the intro king. It's Powers. 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 My next guest was the co-founder of YTC, better known as the Yellow Top Crew out of Manhattan. During the early to mid 90s, their name, product and reputation spread like a dry brush fire. Make no mistake, they had that work. But the gentleman on the left side of your screen is living proof that you can make it to the bright side of the darkness and redefine your life's mission if you so wish to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention because for the first time on the Mike Power Show, ex leader of YTC, the tone is in the building. Thank you, thank you, my brother. Thank you for the intro. Extremely flattered. Appreciate that. We yes. here, man. Building, man. We're in the building, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you being here. So uh, let's get right to it. You were, uh, you and your partner Chango. I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, Chango, 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 yeah, Chango, Chango. Close enough, close enough. You were you you and he were uh, the head of YTC, aka Yellow Top Crew. Um, how did you become? Um, how did y'all two become head of this crew? We was we was more persistent than than our peers, than our friends that was around us. Um, it wasn't like we just decided to be the leader or anything of that nature. It's just that we stood persistent with the hustle. So we when 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 it when it finally hit that we finally caught the flow, you know, um I guess the best analogy I could do is when you got that when we finally got that hit record, they wasn't in the studio with us when we recorded that record. So when they came back in, they had to come back in as signed artists, you know? And what age did y'all did you start pumping? 87, I want to say. I'm kind of confused. It's either 87 or 88. I was either 13. Yeah, that was, matter of fact, it was 88. A few months before my first 14th birthday. So I was 13 going on 14. But not too far away from becoming 14 years old. What was your first day like on the block moving work? Uneventful. I did what I had to do, and everything went as they said it was going to go for the first couple of days. Basically, um, it was out there, you know, serving a product. Like, you know, you got people on the highway that sell waters or people that sell hot dog from a hot dog cart. They're selling crack on the avenue. So all I did was exchange crack for money. It was very uneventful at the moment. I guess that was the kid in me. The re reports that I have read say your crew was doing $5 million a year. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's a fact. Probably more sometimes. You know what I'm saying? We definitely just, But you got to understand, we that when they say that, a lot of people tend to think that um, that's what we made for ourselves. You know what I'm saying? That's what we generated at the end of the year. You know what I mean? Five, six, seven, eight million dollars a year. But we didn't keep that. You know what I'm saying? That wasn't, uh, that, that wasn't going straight into our pocket. You probably kept three million, four million out of that, you know what I'm saying? And then from there you have certain expenses. So, you know what I mean? Probably 1.5 million. But hey, at 14, 15 years old, fuck, that's a lot of money. So, and how many people was in the crew at that time? Fluctuated, you know what I'm saying? But the team was like probably the solid team, that the that the, the, the nucleus of the situation, like even if they were there or not, but like the team that they was just YTC. They couldn't go to no other crew and be an employer, none of that, because nobody was going to accept them or trust them or whatever. It was like probably like 22 of us and shit. And then everybody else was like associate, as if you would like the mafia would say. There was associate, there were the main men, but it was like probably like, there was like 22 of us and shit that was um, quote unquote main men from the team, like grew up saying, but had say, even though played different position. Still had say, still had influence, you know. And you're 14 at this time, 14, 15. Yeah. Uh, 20 some odd people in the crew that you and Chango is uh, co leaders of. Was Were any of these people older than y'all or same age? Uh, who, who was older than us? 
the the rest of the crew members were they all around? I mean, for me, for me, everybody else, for me, ninety percent of everybody else was older than me. You understand what I'm saying? As far as the crew, you know. Um, but yeah, there was people that was older than Chang and all of that because Chang is two years older than me. So, but there was people that was older than them that we had, and you know, under our employment. And even though you was you were younger than them, they still respected you as a leader. Yeah, that's a fact. That's a fact. That's a whole fact. They definitely, you know, respected the situation and followed protocols and, and directions. They definitely did that. I mean, it might seem like a basic question, but if you can remember back, you're making all this money at such a young age, 14, 15, 16. What was you buying yeah. with all that money? Bunch of dumb shit. Now, in hindsight, you know, let's say hindsight is 2020. I mean, I was, you know, my money was going in guns, clothes, clubbing, cars, rims, lawyers, you know, um, and things like that. And we definitely always, you know, stash, we had stash and shit like that, you know what I mean? Looking out for other people and shit like that. Losses, a lot of losses, you know what I'm saying? 50000 here, 100000 there, you know what I mean? All that shit count, you know? Somebody got to pay for that shit. What was the first nice whip you bought after you start making money my first vehicle was a uh acro legend that was and i was on um, 15 and acro legend was a big situation back then and you also had to factor in that there wasn't really no financing or leasing in the hood so you had to go basically with that bread you understand you had to cash out so it wasn't like nobody was gonna sign out for you and you put a thousand dollars two thousand dollars or whatever now you had to cash out yeah my first job was an acro legend Full door. I basically wanted um to follow with Marcus foot um footsteps. He had a Acre Legend coupe and shit. The same year that I bought mine, I couldn't find a coupe. And um and he had the L shit. So but anyway, yeah, Acre Legend, answer your question. I want to stress off the bat that you have consciously, consciously turned your life around. Um, your whole life centers around positivity now. We we're gonna get into that a bit later. Um, first, I want to add a little bit more context uh, for the people. Um, first, when did you decide that you was going to leave your old life behind? All right. I don't want to sit here and, 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 and portray myself as the paragon of virtue. Because that's, 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 that's neither. That's, that's the, I'm nowhere near that. You understand what I'm saying? Um, no, I want to sit here and say, Oh my God, I'm so disgusted with my past life. I'm not proud of it. I don't brag. I don't do that. I, you know what I'm saying? I, yeah. That's not me, but I'm not. Everything happens for a reason and everything plays the purpose. And we're here today and I'm grateful that I'm here today with all the experiences and everything that I was able to live through. All I want to do is just basically do legitimate things and, and, and for exchange of money. I can't say no simple that. I want to make my money legitimately. So I strive to make legitimate revenue streams. Um, I've, I've never been a slimy dude. You understand what I'm saying? Um, I'm not here trying to do no weird shit. I don't care about no one else's property. I'm not trying to rob nobody. I don't care about that. I just care about taking care of my family and living in a certain fashion where I consider comfortable and my family consider comfortable. That's it. And I want to do that legitimately. And that's it. Other than that, I don't have a problem with my personality. I'm not running around doing no crazy shit. I'm not addicted to violence where I got to be in posters. I'm not, none of that. I'm not addicted to doing crime. None of that. Even when I started doing crime, I was always striving or, 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 or hoping that I could find a way to get out of there and be legit. You understand what I'm saying? It's not like the generation now that they got everything going for them, a lot of them, and they still want to run around in the streets and shit. Like, that shit is a fad for them. Like, that shit is cool. That wasn't the case with us. We felt like that shit was a necessity. You understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. And I mean, you were so young when you started. Um, did you did your did your moms know what you was doing out there? Yeah, actually, she did. <clears throat> My mom's always said to me, listen, man, if you're gonna do some crazy shit out there, make sure you tell me. So I won't be running around there, someone else come and tell me, and I look stupid. Because I'm surprised that I don't know what the fuck they talking about. So when the time came that I decided to to to, to sell drugs, um, 
immediately I took it upon myself to inform my mom that what I was doing, you know what I'm saying? Because that's what she told me that I needed to do. And if I did that, everything would be all right. So when I did that, um, she accepted it because, you know, she had no other choice. At least she felt she did it. And, um, and that was that. But I could see the shock in her face when I, when I informed her and showed the 100 bottle of the crack and a 22 revolver that, and told her, listen, Ma, this is what I'm doing right now. But that's basically what I did. Like, yo, Ma, you remember you told me to tell you when I'm doing something crazy out there so nobody else can surprise you with that information? Yeah, all right, so check it. Look, this is what I'm doing. I'm selling crack. Wow. And, 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 and this is the gun that I got right here just in case somebody trying to get crazy. Follow me? Yeah, yeah. Um, people talk about YTC, but there were other crews out there that you had to compete with. Um, like the Purple Top crew, I did. Yeah. I got some information. What would happen when your crew would bump into other other squads? My, this is my godson. This is, I'm going to ask you a question. My godson, you know, oh, no, my this is this is his mm -hmm. with my son, and um, we'll talk about that later. But yeah, absolutely, but, we're going to talk about that. As far as the um. When we, I mean, all right, purple in particular, purple are uh, local neighborhood individuals, um, older than us, and um, this is what happened with the purple. Matter of fact, I never really said the story like that. While we was coming up selling drugs and shit, like when we was, you know, that after I met Chang and we was, you know, running around before we got with Market Thumba, that we was like basically, um exploring, trying to find somewhere, trying to plant our flag, you know what I'm saying? We was roaming around. We sold on 95th and Bro, I mean, in 95th and Amsterdam. We sold on 103rd in the projects, and we sold on 100th Street and Broadway. Like, we floated, we sold on 39th Street between Broadway and 9th. Like, we, we went all over the place, just roaming around Nyack, New York. Like, before we found a home, we roamed around learning the game, you know what I'm saying? And, and finding a place where we could call quote unquote home. One of the places that we last so crack at was 105th. And I say last place because for a moment, market came and took us under the wing and we didn't really did anything with crack with the exception of me copping a couple of ounces and putting them in a spot in the east side so my other homeboys could eat because we were already eating with market Thumba. That being said, um the individuals that were on 105th because everybody was out there. It wasn't like nobody was, there wasn't no particular crew running this block. It was, you know, a bunch of hicks, which is what I call Dominicans that migrate from over there, over here, they don't know how to speak English. <clears throat> speak English. Um, we used to call them hicks, no disrespect, but that's how we refer to them. Um, however, I'm Dominican myself, ironically. Dominican, Puerto Rican, but yeah. Anyway, um, so we was over there in the course of being over there in the course of starting hanging out with market, the other individuals started cleaning out the neighborhood and cleaning the block. So, um, we kind of like, for lack of a better way of saying it, escaped that confrontation with them because market came in, put us under the wing. We were then dealing with the crack. So what they were doing, they finally take over and never happened with a bumping head. But when market died, we went back to selling crack because it wasn't like he left us a fucking will or no type of shit. You understand what I'm saying? It wasn't like he left us any inheritance or none of that. Um, so when we went back to the streets and shit, we went back to 105th Street because that was the last place where we sold crack. However, these kids had already ran everybody out and had the block situated, but we didn't give a fuck at that moment. We just put on, literally put up Grand opening sign, like they do in the supermarket, tied that shit from tree to tree and sat down with a milk crate and basically was like, we out, you know what I mean? But one of the owners came up to me and was like, yo, you know what, man? Like, you know, y'all niggas violent. Y'all seen we put in the work to close this down. Now, I don't know sucker shit because the nigga ain't no sucker, you know what I'm saying? He get busy himself. He just was talking, reading. So he spoke to me and he was like, yo, bro, that's crazy. We put this work in. Y'all nigga just came in. Like, that, that shit ain't cool. You know what I mean? We put that work. Y'all seen we put that work in. So I was like, you know what? You're right. So we took it across 106th Street, went a few blocks down to 107th Street, established ourselves there. And that's how, after we did that, I guess they underestimated and think we weren't going to be able to do nothing with the block, but we blew the block up. 
and became a major competitor to them. And that's where the friction, but it was never no real targeted beef, even though there was episodes of things that happened, but it was never like we was really because ain't nobody died amongst us. So it really wasn't that major, you know what I'm saying? So that was that. I, paint, I want to paint this picture because I want to touch on something that you just said. Did you just say that you literally uh, put up a grand opening sign on the block? <laughs> yeah, grand opening sign. It's sick. Actually, I, I I didn't put it up myself. Um, my 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 co D, my partner, and you know part of the team is sick. Face Ern, Ernie, he put the fucking grand sign, the grand opening sign up and shit. But yeah, I was definitely sitting under it with the milk crate along with him and whoever else was there with us at the time. I mean, in the course of doing my research, I ended up coming across a picture online. It had Chango's face and your face on it, and it was slapped on a on a light pole. You have you seen what was that about? On a light pole, like like a poster. Yeah. I mean, that was you know that there were some people dealing with Chang that was really trying to push you know the documentary to then push the film, and they was um basically also promoting um one of the info mind documentary. So that was like a campaign, I believe. How much weight do you think your crew was moving every week? Weekly, as far as the the crack spot itself, we was doing like two bricks a week, bottled up and little bottle of the crack retail, two dollar bottle of crack. And um, where did you keep all the money? Was it in the bank? <laughs> all right, it wasn't. It? Was it shoebox under the mattress? You shoe had a stash box, house, shopping bag, safe. You know what I'm saying? Um, safe deposit boxes in the bank, you know what I'm saying? Shit like that. Grandma, aunt, whoever you trust, you give them your money. You know what I'm saying? Shit like that. You spread it out. Usually in, in that time, in those days, niggas' money be spread it out. You know what I'm saying? You might have some with your mom because you trust her. You have some with your shorty because you trust her to that extent. You know what I mean? And, and things of that nature. Everybody has. You was taking care of a lot of people, I would, I would assume. Um, I'm, about how many people was you holding down from the family? Um, I took care of individuals when they went to prison and they were in the pond. That's when I really took care of individuals and shit. Um, as far as doing handouts, I, ain't, I wasn't really into the handout. However, if it was the elders from the neighborhood and they needed something, you know, and, and, and I know that they it wasn't because they took their money and they fucked it up doing some other dumb shit, then I ain't had no problem putting that money up. And if they did fuck it up and they were going to jeopardize one of the youngins in the, in the, in the, in the household, then I'll put the money up. I ain't have no problem doing that. You dig? But however, I was very big on putting people to get money. You know what I'm saying? Putting you in a position. I don't care what it was. It could have been like, you might be good selling. Literally, this is what things that have happened. You do, you like selling patalitos and shit. This is these fried. I don't know if you're familiar with what a patalito is, but I'm pretty sure that shit, that, that terminology is universal. That's different than empanadas, right? That's the same thing, empanadas. Okay. Was there anyone that you actually trusted in the game? I probably trusted too many people. Hmm. Probably, did, huh? One of them, did one of those people end up burning you? Oh yeah, hell yeah. I mean, they they I mean, he, yeah, he tried to get he tried to hurt me physically. He did get me hurt physically, it wasn't to the extent that they 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 was trying. I got shot. And then um he went and got us indicted with the district attorney and all that. So um I would say, yeah, he hurt me. Well, what happened when you got shot? Can you talk about that? Um, I was actually outside, more or less on the back that I was showing you on the ad, and um I was standing on the, in the doorway and I was waiting to give some money to um one of my partner's wife and shit. He was locked up and shit for a murder and shit. So we, you know, we taking care of his wife, like I we should do. So I'm waiting for her because um I want to make sure that she count the money in front of me because there's been some discrepancy with the money. So um, in the course of waiting for them to go upstairs and count out the money they were going to give to her, some people was coming up on the block and I kind of smelt it. And I seen what it was, but I didn't really think it was a, a direct hit to me. I thought it was they going to come do some dumb shit and try to shoot the block up. So I told everybody to disperse that was in front of me and I walked to the building to try to get a gun, but the block was hot. So the picture that usually have a gun on them actually stashed it because it's like damn i don't want to get caught with crack and a gun if push come to shove so 
he took the gun upstairs. So when I went, there wasn't no gun. So they telling me to stay in the building. But I'm feeling like, nah, I'm not going to stay in the building because it's like I left everybody else for dead. But they, it was a direct hit for me. So when I turned around to walk out the building, the dude with, that was coming behind me, he thought that I already had the gun. So he just started shooting from the distance that he was at at the time that I turned around. And um, it was a pretty, you know, it was like probably like 50 feet away or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Probably a little more. So, you know, I got hit one time. It went through my arm and hit me in the head and shit. And um, police was riding up the block at the moment that he was shooting. So when they seen them shooting, they hit the free. He turned the gun on the police and shot at them. I hit one of them in the head. And, um, you know, shit went crazy from there. Wait, you fired you fire back and you end up hitting the cop? I, I ain't fired back. I got hit. And the course of me getting hit that he was shooting at me, police were driving up the block. They seen them in action. And, the, and, and so they basically, you know, they go into their mode, jump out, freeze. When they hit them with the freeze, he turned the gun on them and oh. let them that police and ended up shooting one of them in the head and shit. Did that cop end up surviving or would that new murder yeah, be? For the... shot in the head. He just got shot in the head and shit. Oh, in the hand. I thought you said head. I'm sorry. I got shot in the head. I got shot. If shit went through my arm and hit me in the head, but it got stuck and all of that. And um, basically, I plucked the bullet out in the course of running upstairs and shit. In the building, you know, I felt my head. I felt that shit. I plucked that shit out. I wish I should have kept that shit. I would have put that shit in, in some way as a memorabilia. And I'm just not going to ask what happened to that dude. Because I'm just going to assume that it wasn't sweet and it didn't go unanswered. I um, mean, the, 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 not the dude that actually shot me. And the funny thing about it is that the team... The team that 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 was involved in the hit, cause it was like it ended up being like four dudes from Brooklyn. Cause the kid that ended up hitting me and hitting the cop got caught, and he basically let him know who else was with him because everybody else got away. But he let him know, so they went and picked everybody else up in the crib in Brooklyn. Anyway, make a long story short, one of the kids, and the reason that I know this is because they picked me up at the hospital and they put them, they put me, in, you know, they put them on the lineup, and um. I ain't pick them out because I ain't know who they was, but I could tell who they was because they was all clean cut, but and they looked stressed next to people that was like you know smoking or or didn't look stressed. You understand? So it's easy for you to tell, even if you don't, if, even if you didn't see the person that did the crime, you could tell he must be the one because of the way he looked and body language. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Yeah. So I was able to tell who the fuck was the people that participated because I really didn't know who it was or where it came from at the moment, and that shit is kind of you know, scary and frustrating in itself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when they told me, yo, watch the, the, the lineup, I knew I wasn't going to say nothing, but I wanted to see what the fuck was going on and see if I knew who it was that they caught. So I saw these individuals. I ain't know them, but I knew who they was. Make a long story short, I ended up and in, in, in getting locked up a month later. I ended up in my hand house. I'm in the house with one of the kids from the shooting that shot me. There's no separation because I'm not testifying or telling on these niggas. So I'm just a regular person going in the house with them. If I would have been cooperating against them or whatever, they would have not put me in the house with them because we would have had a separation. You understand what I'm trying to tell yeah. you? Yeah. So I ended up in the house with the nigga. He couldn't, he didn't remember me. So I go in the house anyway and sit down with the nigga and all that. And basically he, when he realized who I was, he was scared, but I, I told him, listen, bro, mom, I ain't got no personal beef with you. You know what I'm saying? You got paid to do a hit. It ain't personal. I don't know you. My drama is with the dude that did the hit. This that paid you. And in the course of that, um, that person that paid them, I definitely dealt with them. We definitely did that. Mm, got you. And at that time, if you can think back, if you can remember back, you, you're moving all this weight. You're the leader of, of this crew. What were your dreams at that time? For the future. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I, I I didn't think I was going to live past 25. I thought that would have been a lot a, a lot of years to live. And if I would have lived to 25, I would have felt like I made it. And that shit is sad when you think about it now. Um, but that was my reality then. So my desire was just basically for my family and me and, and you know, and 
so we we won't need for nothing. That was basically it. So, you know, we always wanted to look for an investment, something to do. However, we didn't really have anyone next to us that was really business savvy in that sense, you know. We had entrepreneurs, but they was winging it, so they really wouldn't come teach us. You could make your money legit or illegally. We were going to pick legit every time. Mm. We didn't think we had a choice. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? And we went with what we was able to do at that moment. Immediately, which was sell drugs. Now, personally, I didn't have working papers. But when I started selling drugs, I was 13. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? And I basically started selling drugs because I needed an outfit for Easter. And I needed that outfit more than what I did before because I had this girl that I liked that liked me and was like, yo, let's go to Great Adventures. So I needed an outfit for Great Adventures and I needed money to go to, to Great Adventures. And my mom didn't have it. And I had overheard her talking on the phone with one of our friends telling her that she wasn't going to have money for us for Easter because the check was going to come late for some reason or whatever. And that shit didn't really sit well with me, man, being that I was just, you know, feeling this girl. She was feeling me. She was bad. I didn't want to lose that opportunity. So that's when I went out searching and I tried to go work in a store around my block and they dubbed me. And I tried to, you know, you know, pick up cans and that shit wasn't working out. And I tried to go pack, pack bags, but the kids from that neighborhood had that shit on smash. And then one day I was walking by to my pop's block and my mom and my pop separated when I was five years old. So my pops was living on Wharton. That's one side of the Bronx. And we lived on the other side of the Bronx on Bristol. So I'm going on Wharton. And when I'm walking up on the block, after I get off the train and I'm walking to the block and I'm walking the block, I see my man Ed with a bunch of money. And Ed is a dude that's in the same economic state that I'm in. He don't really got it. His family don't really got it. So he, he ain't really got it. So he ain't, all this money in his hand was like, where the fuck you get that money from? And when he explained it to me, I was like, I need N. And that was when I first started selling crack. And I sold my first crack on the 165th and Warren Avenue. You, know? you obviously had to uh, carry a weapon in this, in this line of work to, to protect your turf, your, your bodily person, um, your product. What was your weapon of choice? Um, my, my weapon of choice, the weapon that I like the most, that I'm most comfortable with, to walk around with is a 38 snub nose. Now listen, I grew up, I'm a hip hop guy. You know what I mean? I, I, Big Daddy Kane, Rakim, BDP, Dougie Fresh, all of these guys. And, you know, I'm not from New York. You know, I'm originally from Cleveland. We always looking at the videos and, and looking at New York because y'all always had the fashion. It seemed like eight months to a year before the fashions would get anywhere else. And one of the things I know New York is known for is the fly leathers. What type, when you was making all this money, what kind of leathers did you have? Um, when I was out, I basically did a lot of pelapeles, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or cannon. Um, but I didn't do that shit with the soda can. I don't like that loud shit. I like, I like subtle shit. I'm the type of dude that, like, I had my mom, my mark mechanic was solid colors. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, but that's what I would did. And, um, you know, before that, we did the leather bombers and the bee bombers and shit like that. And the sheep skins and shit like that. You know what I mean? Motherfucking, um, they had the, the leathers with the tassels. I wasn't really into that. But more mark mechanics and shit like that. Yeah. Did you, did you ever rock the troop jackets? Nah, I was a little too young for the troop jacket. I had troop sneakers, though. But I read this online. By the time you had a problem with a business associate named Raymond, um, is that the person that ended up putting that hit out on you? Um, Allegedly. Allegedly. Okay. So that situation but we just talked about. He had guilty to that situation. That's him. I'm not going to say he did it. But allegedly, he's the one that did it. He's the one that put the hit out on it. You know what I mean? So that's why we allegedly shot him. You know what I'm Got you. <laughs> Got you. He pled guilty. If I'm getting this wrong, correct me. Online reports say that you were charged with 10 murders. The team, yeah, the team was actually with um nine murders. But you gotta understand, it wasn't like it was it's 41 of us. So everybody's not charged with a murder. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? 
but the indictment had nine murders in it. You know what I mean? But everybody in the indictment is not charged with murder. Everybody gets charged with their individual crime, but the shit that they did according to their individual actions. You know what I'm saying? Some sold crack, some shot people, some stole whatever. You know what I'm saying? That's what you get charged with. Um, and you you had you had cops on the payroll. How was it that you were able to form relationships with Twelve to get them on the payroll? I mean, I ain't really was I, shit. That shit that shit was by happenstance. That it wasn't like I formed a relationship. What happened was there was a cop in the neighborhood that was that was from downtown, from another associate's neighborhood. But the the associate that he that 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 we knew. He wasn't no cop. He was a street nigga. You know what I'm saying? He was a shooter. So anyway, we knew him. And he fucked around with us. And he hung out with us and did business with us and ran around with us and things of that nature. Party with us. He was basically going just down there to sleep. But his days and all, he was working up there. Like, you know, he was making, he was basically running with us up here. However, when this cop was assigned this area after, you know, graduating the, the academy or whatever the case may be, do we see him like, oh shit, they already had a relationship from before that kids. So <clears throat> they get the talking. This dude had an influence over him. The one from the streets had an influence over the cop. And um, I'm assuming, guys, you know what I'm saying, that he told them, listen, this is what we could be doing. But anyway, this cop was running around. Snatching niggas' packs and shit like that. And what you gonna do? You gonna confront the pack, the officer, and tell him, give me the pack back? You know what I'm saying? But he wasn't these packs. He was passing them off to the other nigga and shit like that. He didn't really get that far with us, but he was trying to, like, you know, it cut off, whatever. But the dude, again, being that we had personal relationships with him, we were able to speak to him, and he basically patched us in with the cop. You know what I'm saying? And told the cop, like, yo, fuck with him. You know, and, and 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 that's how all that came about. And I started giving him a weekly, um, you know, some money weekly. And he would, you know, put me on point on what was going on in the hood. Like, you know, like as far as from the cops, like if we were extra hot or what they would say to the precinct or if a picture was, you know, put up, like, you know, talking about one of the youngins and shit, like for a particular, there was a youngin that had a, a warrant out for him because he left his DIY camp. Never went back after a motherfucking um 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 furlough. Yeah, like I said, we're in the shop. Give me a minute. We think going out, but someone came in. What's going on, brother? I'm doing a zoom in. Yeah, we opening up right now. We yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. We got independent designers in here. You understand what I'm saying? Everything we carry is independent designers, and then we got basically city labs for regular day. You know, get ups and stuff like that. Sweatshirts. Shorts. Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's global currency. But, yeah, that's the name of that design. But I'm doing the Zoom. You can look through it, no matter. No, 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 and no, 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 you ain't doing nothing wrong, but um, you can look through it and all that and, you know, come back around afterwards and talk to one of the guys. We're here, man. Hey, we're here. This is your place. I'll see you. Guys again. You too. All right, my brother. Um, Excuse me for that, but... um, No, you're good. Probably good footage anyway. No, um, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. But you were written about in the New York Times. Yeah. Um, that, that's a paper that goes all over the world. What did that first article in New York Times do for your reputation? Oh, no, that put us all over the place, man. That was, you see, we, when we hit the papers at that time, the New York Times, that's a prestigious paper. But then even being on the Daily News, that is a, that's a city prestigious neighbor, you know, on, on paper. You know what I'm saying? The Daily News, the New York Post. You know, we were in the Diario. And, uh, and, you know what I'm saying, those are the Spanish papers, and then we was on the Spanish news and the English news, like, you know, news broadcasts on TV. So all that right there at that time was major. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's one of the major reasons why we're speaking right now, you and I. Right now, anybody, you can kick a cat and get in the newspaper. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So it didn't really hold that same type of um, prestige, that same type of way, that awe. So when that shit first happened, the first thing that happened was when we got arrested and I seen that newspaper was like, damn, we fucked up. But then I learned about um, sensationalization, you know what I'm saying? Like the way they speak and put things together and have you hype the fuck up. Um, and then I was like, oh, shit, that's crazy. We made the papers, you know what I'm saying? So it was scary 
intimidating, flattering, all at the same time, if it makes sense. Yeah, so I, and I know sometimes when you when you go out in clubs, I mean, we see this in New Jack City where uh, Wesley Snipes as Nino Brown goes into the club. I think Dougie Fresh was performing at the time Nino came into the club. I, I imagine you come across some famous people. Um, but I heard that you used to be or used to hang out with actor uh, Merlin Santana. He was on the Cosby show, Moesha, Steve Harvey show. Uh, can you talk to me about that relationship? Yeah, um, he's from the neighborhood, rest in peace and shit. And what happened was he'd been doing these, you know, Chips Ahoy commercials and all of that since young. And he's a couple of years younger than us, he was. So, you know, when we was young, he was younger, obviously, you know what I mean? So he's been getting money. So he always had these things that we didn't have, like these motorbikes and things like that. So what happened was the kids from the projects used to, see him when he used to bring the bike down and ask him for a ride and take his shit on a joy ride for hours. You know what I'm saying? And they, they always brought him back the bike, but by the time they brought it back, it was time for him to go upstairs. Or he probably wasn't ready upstairs. They just brought the bike back, make sure he got it back. So it wasn't really, never really stolen like that, but they was just bogarting and shit. They could, um, his mom's hollered that at one of my friends and, um, and shit. Actually, again, ironically, Ernie, and was like, yo, listen, man, I need you to solve this situation for me and um, stop these kids from taking my son's bike. And once you do that, when he's not riding, you want to come get it, you can come get it, and you can ride it too and all that. So he told me, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm all the way with that. We're not even, you know, we're not even regarding that he's an actor. I don't give a fuck. I'm not even thinking about that shit. I'm thinking about riding the bike. So we go over there and we confront the dude at his house. We confront the kid at his house. One of the kids, the main kid that was taking the bike, we confront the nigga at his house. And um, we wowed out. As soon as he came to the door, we just popped on him and started beating him up. And he got the hit after he ain't touching the bike. And mom got mad cool with us. And that's how Merlin got cool with us. But then Merlin caught like, uh, um, even though he was making the same money we were making, if not more, legitimately, he had like a, a love for the streets. Like he was attracted to the street. Like ironically, for me, I didn't understand that. Um, but he was, but we, we had love for him. So we, we let him hang out with us and he was in the mix of shit, but we didn't get him, let him get involved with nothing that was going to jeopardize his, his, his career and things of that nature. Cause we knew more, you know, better than anything that he was better off with the way he was doing that. That if we had the opportunity to do the same thing, we would do it. You know what I mean? But he was just intrigued with the street that way, but luckily he was with us. Um, yeah. So Merlin was definitely always around us and all the blocks and everything. So even after he was on the Cosby show, y'all would still see him in the hood. We was he was with us all the way until I went to jail in '94. He would still be around and through all them shows, everything. And if he would have been, if we would have been home for the Steve Harvey show, he would have still been around us. He would have been chilling. We would have been running around. But if he would still been alive when we came home, we would have been at a different level right now with the people that he knew and the shit that we got. And he was already supposedly. From my understanding, talking to Chang about wanting to produce the movie of the YTC movie and shit and all that. However, I never spoke to him myself, but I don't, you know, he spoke to Chang and shit. Chang said that he spoke about that shit, but uh, yeah. And man. then um he got ended up getting unceremoniously murdered in California from some goofball, right? Yeah. About about some girl. A real waste of life, you know what I'm saying? That's what you call a real waste of life, man. This kid had so much going for him. Even though he might have been going through some type of depression, as they say, I don't know for sure. He was going through his little moment. However, he still had so much shit going for him that, you know, it's sad to see the way he, they, they just killed that kid like that for no reason. Just because a bitch wanted a lot in, in, in order to save her face and herself. Because from, I don't know, I wasn't there. I don't really, I didn't speak to nobody that was there. I just read a bunch of accounts. And um, I'm definitely not going to go ask his mom what the fuck happened in detail because I'm not going to make her open up his wounds up when in reality, I'm just being nosy and ain't like I could do much about it at this point. So I say all that to say that I don't really know in detail. However, what I've gathered, knowing him in the streets and what I, and the information, Shorty was with them. She got caught by her man or somebody that knew her man in order for her to see face. She said these niggas had a, you know, trapped off with this some foul shit. 
You know what I mean? And and the shit went crazy, and my man got killed. And again, speaking about Merlin Santana, really um, talented, gifted actor too. Like, dude was good at what he did. Very. Are there any rappers that you know for a fact borrow stories from your lifestyle and put it on wax? For a fact, no, nah, I don't know for a fact. You know what I'm saying? I don't know for a fact. However, you know what I'm saying? Um, there were stories about Mob Deep mentioning us and their music and shit, talking about certain things and, you know, subtly about the neighborhood and, and individuals and shit. As far as referring to us as, as yellow bags and talking about my man, Jose Luis, and shit like that. But I don't really know because I ain't never had no, no, no dealing with them. And if we did, we didn't know because we did had issues in a lot of clubs and, you know, and but we never knew if these people was anybody other than, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Because, for example, we we had a situation in, 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 in Club 2000 and shit. This is a club of 157 back in the day. And um, the wool came through and, and, and we had a slight issue, but I'm pretty sure they'll remember us. And we didn't know who the fuck they were at that time. We knew down the road the fuck they were, you know what I'm saying? From, you know, who they became and us associating and calculating and like, oh shit, that was okay, cool. So, like that. But um, we ain't really had too many dinners personally with rappers. We seen a bunch of rappers, but I ain't had no dinners with rappers. Rappers wasn't really like um, impressive to us. You know what I'm saying? That's when you had, a, you had a situation with the Wu, you said, do you remember what specific people from the Wu that you were talking about? I mean, I didn't really have a, 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 a situation like with people, but the Wu, like Ray, um, um, I'm for sure. And um, I want to say Ghost, but I know Ray, they used to come through and see these chicks that lived in the neighborhood, some French chicks and shit. And, and me, mind you, we got the tape in the car, we listened to them. But just us young on our bullshit, you know what I mean? Like, you're not just going to come through the hood like, fuck that, we don't fuck about that shit. Like, and they wanted to put on a sticker, so they asked the dude for the, in the store to put up a sticker. And um, the dude from the store was like, yeah, yeah, you can put the sticker up. But when they went to put the sticker up, we was like, nah, don't put that shit up there, B. Like, so he's looking at us like the dude said we could, but I, I see where we're going with that. And they ain't put the sticker up. So now in hindsight, they probably say, you know what? We're not even going to get into it because we, we we at odds. The odds is against us. At that moment, we were like, yeah, these niggas is pussy. But they was just being smart. Like that shit would have not went well. And that don't it don't make them be a pussy. They just they the wind the odds was against them. You act, did you actually own hand grenades? Yeah, we owned a couple of hand grenades and shit. Did you, did you ever you ever use one? Hell no. I'm glad I didn't. I wasn't really trying to use one of them shit because I knew that once we threw one of them shits, the feds is coming. You know what I mean? And we didn't really know we were young, so we didn't really know the extent of the damage that that shit was going to be done. But we definitely had people thinking we were going to throw that shit. And we definitely knew that. We definitely had people um, 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 aware that we had them shits. We parade them shits like the Russians do their missiles. You know what I'm saying? We came through letting people know, like, you got these grenades. I throw this shit in your building. You be fucked up. But thank God we ain't never got to use one of them. I really didn't want to use one of them. I ain't going to sit here and tell you, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to shoot. Ah. I would have threw that shit if I felt the need to, though. Bet that, though. But you used to walk around with a grenade and a Crown Royal bag, right? Nah, I, I mean, that was a, a, a situation. They stole, like, you know, on Christmas Eve, we came, you know, over Christmas Eve, that somebody broke on in, in one of the stash cribs, what they call a trap, and, and they stole, like, like 7,000 bottles of crack. So when we went in there, them 7,000 bottles was missing. That's a lot of fucking money. You know what I'm saying? So I was highly upset, especially for Christmas after cashing out for all the presents and everything else that goes along with Christmas. So I was like, damn. So we wanted to know who it was. So what we did was got more work, bottled that up in black top, despite the fact that we yellow top. So that way, when the yellow top pops up, wherever it pops up, we're going to follow that shit like the yellow brick road. And that's exactly what happened. So in the course of doing that shit, we running up in people's apartment, and I got that crime royal with that grenade in. So every time I went and did my interrogation, the first thing I did was take that grenade and put it on the table so they could see that we wouldn't play no fucking game. And we were going to tolerate no bullshit. So 
Yeah, that was an incident where we were running around with the with the with the grenade and the motherfucking on brown court. How many people do you know? Because I know it's this is a sometimes somebody could be so tough and so so big and so ominous that they end up getting whacked because people is intimidated by them. How many people do you know in this game that got killed because they was just too scary, too intimidating? People feared them too much. They had to get rid of them. I don't know nobody that got that got that got killed just because they was too scary or whatever. Everybody that got killed was because they provoked that death. You know what I'm saying? Some way, somehow. Whether it was um justifiable, even though I don't think there's really anybody's right to kill. But you know what I'm talking about. Um, whether it was justifiable or some blatant abuse shit. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Yep. They, they brought it on on themselves. You know what I'm saying? Like for example. I could have said that this kid got killed because he was too scary or whatever, but nah, it wasn't just because he was too scary or whatever. He smacked this individual in front of his girl. So the individual went upstairs, got a gun, and shot him in, behind, in the head right behind the precinct. Probably regretted it afterwards, but you just violated this man by slapping the shit out of him in front of his girl. So he had, he felt the need. He felt obligated he had to do something, you know? So that's why I say um, it depends on, on, on situation, not that anybody was scared it was based on what the fuck they did. Other situation may be is you might be, you might be looking like a plate. You understand? You looking real healthy right now and shit. Niggas is hungry and, and shit like that. You think? And, and so a dude might get killed for that and shit. Cause he playing around, dudes is hungry. They come get up and he resists and they killed him. You know what I'm saying? Other than that, it's, um, dudes created a situation. But in the course of it, of course, they scary like this dude Sammy in Santana. That was one of the bodies that we caught. He was extorting niggas. He was a scary dude. He had my mom scary. He made us nervous at the end of the day when he when he focused on us because if he didn't make us nervous, which you know, quote unquote, could be like God is a little nervous, scared, or whatever, then we would have not felt the need to knock his fucking head off. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So that's what it all boiled down to at the end of the day. New York Times says your enforcer was a guy named Pito. Yeah. Can you talk about Pito? Allegedly. Yeah, Pito, Pito is um, my cousin and shit. We grew up together. It's not like um, my mom or his mom. Or, you know, it's not like blood, but it might as well be. We closer than with some people that I'm blood with. And um, my mom and his mom, they, they consider themselves sisters. So that's why we say we're cousins. But yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the one um, accused of being the enforcer, Pito. We just spoke to him a couple of days ago. What about him? Um, is he is he free on the street? Nah, unfortunately, he went to trial. He got a hundred years. Do you have any idea that you would eventually get caught up in the system, or did that not occur to you when you was doing what you were doing? I didn't think I was gonna get caught up in the system, and, and to the to 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 the extent that we got caught up, I was under the impression that you know what I'm saying if anything we do you know no more than five years was the worst case scenario and shit. Um, I, I wasn't really factoring in the conspiracy law. Uh, I wasn't aware of that. So everything else was, if you catch me, so if, if it was, we shot somebody, as long as nobody was there to say that we shot them, we were good. As long as I didn't get caught with a gun, I was good. As long as I didn't get caught with no drug on me, I was good. So that was the thing that I was focused. But that conspiracy law snatched a nigga out of this fucking living room with no tangible evidence. I say that to say, I never been caught with drugs. I never got caught with a gun on me. I've never been accused to actually shoot somebody's butt. They say that I agree with these individuals to do these crimes and that I was the one that was basically spearheading the situation along with Chad. Follow me? Yeah, and then you 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 were on Rikers. Uh, how long did you spend on Rikers? Um, almost three years. And what was it like for you in there? Um who were you close to in there? I mean, I, I was cool with, with with different people. I was in the house. I was in Brooklyn House for the majority of my time, and um, a CMC house in Brooklyn on the tenth floor. And um, I was in there when initially with Pacualito from the Wild Cowboy. We was cool. Then he got packed up because he wanted to have a surgery and fuck with you know his finger was fucking with him, and they was neglecting it. So he tried to pull a stunt so they could handle his finger. And um, they thought he was doing some other shit, so they ended up transferring him from Brooklyn to Queens. And in the course of doing that, they brought his other co-defendant there, which was Fat Danny. Yeah, and that's when I met Fat Danny. 
and uh, we was there for a little while. Then they moved at Danny and they brought Lenny and, and Plata and all over. Shit, this is all wild cowboy dude. You know? So we was there, shit. Then they shipped and like that. So and then I've been around Patty. I've been around Dead Eye, which was one of the founders from the cow, um, from the Bloods and shit, and um, OG Dead Eye. I mean, I've been around a few people and shit. You know what I mean? Um, what did you learn from your time behind bars? Patience. I've learned. Um, I've learned patience. I've I haven't. I ain't fully grasped it totally, but I've learned to you know to pace myself and to look around. And um, um, before I, I cross, you understand what I'm trying to tell you? So um, don't make no hasty decisions and um, do my due diligence. And don't try to chase the Joneses and shit like that. I, 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 I served a real sentence. I served altogether 21 years in prison. Oh, Lord. I just finished coming home like three and a half months ago. You know what I'm saying? Or for a four-year bit that I just finished wrapping up. And shit, and that's it. And I and, and look, in, in three months and change, we already got this store up and running and working. Let's talk about this store real quick before I go, because I got to ask a few more questions that have to do with the lifestyle. But you, since you brought this up, you're sitting in a shop. What block we on right now? We're in Manhattan. This is actually where everything happened at for me. This is the block right here. Everything happened. You know? This is the block. I got shot. I got shot in that doorway right there. That used to be my junior high school. Look at T. Washington. Now, it's to sell crack right here. Now we sell t shirts and, and clothing by independent design. It's this up and coming. We give them a platform so they can showcase. Their clothing and all of that, but we can get more into that. Give me a gist. So we got this shop right here. This is the fellas. Word up. You know, this is the shop. No, no, we we're between 107th and 106th in Columbus Avenue right now. And this is what the legal money part of it looked like right now. So you got this shop going with your son, am I right? Well, my son and my godson. The your son and your godson, right? Yeah. And and so it's it's fashion, obviously. Talk to me about the concept. So basically, um, my son and my godson wanted to open up a shop. Basically, you know, do the right thing, and um, we came up with the idea of opening up a shop that catered to independent designers. Because we're very big on the underdog. You understand what I'm saying? Because we consider. Yeah. So, so we take independent designers that's taking their work seriously and we place their product. So basically, we give them a platform to showcase their product, their merchandise, and generate money. And they make money, we make a couple of dollars, and we do something beneficial where we keep the, the, you know, the youth motivated. And it's a win-win at the end of the day. You know what I mean? And then we got City Labs in here, which is what basically... At the end of the day, pay the rent because these are t-shirts that people buy every single day. So, you know what I'm saying? As long as I do 30, 40 city labs, I pay for the rent and everything else in here. I don't got to go in my pocket and doing that. But we got different things. Like, for example, we got a girl from the Bronx that do candles, handmade candles. And we collaborated with her for the shop. And she put these candles together. So we educated young dudes from the hood like, yo, bro. Buy yourself a candle, like that shit in your room. So when your shorty come in, she can see that you got some manners and you got some some type of class. Or even take it to the telly with you, you know what I'm saying? So basically, that's what we're doing, man. We basically um, got a shop and we let kids, you know. Now we came up with another idea with the space that we have. We're going to get independent artists to put their paintings up here for sale. And at the same time, we'll have the art in the, in the shop that will make it look nice. And we give a platform to the kids to sell they joint and we make a little commission in it because we got to keep the light and the, and the rent paid. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So, um, and that's that, man. And everybody feel motivated, man. And, and there's other people that's looking forward to opening up other businesses in the hood right now. So we kind of like started a trend with this. What does it mean to you 
to be able to, to come out, make legal money and to show other people what legal success looks like, especially your son and your godson. What, what, what's that feeling like? It feels like a blessing. It feels like a blessing, man. It feels like, you know, it, it is a great feeling to see my son and my daughters and my granddaughter come through and run around and be on a shop and chill in front of the shop on the sidewalk and bringing that type of energy and having the kids have a place to come pull up and chill. You know what I'm saying? It feels great. It's, it's a blessing. You know, technically, you know, according to statistics, I'm not supposed to be here. You think so? To be able to be here and do that on the same block that um, I basically was doing a whole bunch of negative shit. It's, it's like, wow, I got an opportunity to turn a negative and, uh, into a positive right here in my own block, my own neighborhood. So it feels great, man. It's a blessing, man. I feel blessed. Is this what you do on a daily? You wake up in the morning, you go to this shop, you make sure everything going well there. That's what you spend most of your time at? Um, yeah, as of late, I spend a lot of time here, but um, I'm moving around, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm conducting. That was one of the other reasons of, of, of having your own business to be able to be flexible. So if I'm not handling business with one of my daughters and shit, um, cause I got two younger ones and shit, 112, 113. And then I got one that's 28. Um, she got everything on smash. Um, she's a great girl. She, but the little ones, let's say if I got to do some, I have the opportunity to move around. And you got, you got hats, you got shirts, what else y'all got in there? But you got you got candles, you got shorts, jeans, shoes. What else you got? We got um a little bit of everything, man. We got a boutique situation, so that's another thing that we offer exclusivity. So we got uh, um the pieces that we got here. Once they get sold out, chances of you seeing them again would be slim to none because it's not mass produced. Again, it's independent designer, so they budget is but so big, which it works for us. If you were the type of person that don't want to see your shit all over the place, but then we got certain things with merch on it. For example, this is the, the merch from um, my sons and them because they, they, they got their own movement, the Guala Boy, Guala Life. And shit. So I was going to ask you about that. Talk to me. What is Guala Boy? Because I started on your IG page. Um, Actually, that's just like, um, you know, when they say um, nigga instead of nigga, mm -hmm. and a, a term of endearment. For, for, for the majority, not everybody, a lot of people still don't jack it, but, um, but you understand where I'm going? Like, so then Guala was something like that. People that didn't speak Spanish, if they saw two individuals that speak in Spanish with each other, and if they knew that the individuals knew how to speak English, they would feel uncomfortable, and they would say something to the extent, like, yo, stop talking that Guala, Guala shit, or whatever the case. Mm -hmm. So we just took that and was like, you know, we Guala boys. We speak English and Spanish. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? We, we even though we were born and raised here or grew up here and could identify with the hip hop and all of that, we still know that we're Latin. We still know that we, you know, and we're not going to deny or neglect that part of the culture either. Right, you right. You got individuals and in all different walks of races. You got Hispanics that want to act and move black and disregard not even realizing that we're all black but we're all african you just you know different places that in the culture is different that's it but technically like you know we're we're all derived from the same tree you think so mm -hmm. that being said um however the culture is what deviates so if i grew up in a dominican culture i'm not gonna neglect it just to impress you and act or right. black or white or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? I could I could indulge in, 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 in like the black culture and partake into it without having to neglect my Hispanic culture. You understand what I'm trying to and that's what Guala Life is all about. There ain't no discrimination, none of that. It's just us being able to rep who we are without offending no one while still being respected in the English culture because we put in work in that shit too. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So, so yeah. we, as Americans, we, we watch a lot of stylized reenactments of drug life, whether it be like the show snowfall, the snow, like power, we see a lot of delicate situations unfold. Can you tell me about a time where you were under a lot of stress and had to make a big decision or a big move? 
Like what? Like what? Like I understand more or less what, like in what particular area. It's, like maybe there was something that you had to make a decision about. You're sitting in your house is weighing on you. Maybe you have a choice of whether you need to go talk to somebody. Or you need to go send somebody to do something. It been decisions that been needed to be made concerning the last vote on somebody's life. You understand what I'm saying? And um, and those those at times have stressed individuals out due to the person that we was deciding their fate. You understand what I'm saying? But um, ironically, my grandmother, rest in peace, used to be able to read my body language. Mm. And she could tell when I was off. And she would ask me, and I wouldn't want to really reveal much. So I would say, like, no, nah, everything is cool, girl. Don't worry about it. Everything is cool. I'm dealing with it. I'm cool. And she would say something to the extent, like, well, listen, man. Before I go take you some flowers to the cemetery, I'd rather send you some money for some cookie up north. And that used to determine the person's fate at that moment right there. Like, fuck that. I'm not going to, you know, because you need the thing that we did was with individuals that we felt if we didn't do what we do, they were going to do that shit to us. You understand? It wasn't to try to take nobody's shit. It wasn't about trying to implement fear and, and just do this so they could know that we ain't playing. Like, nah, it was because these people threatened our lives one way, some some way, somehow. You know what I'm saying? Other than that, we didn't go into the block having to do anything to nobody. We went into the block strategically. You understand what I'm saying? With mental shit. Like, we went in there, we put the, we, we, we took a building that nobody was using, and we made it work for our advantage, and we took the price and of the drug, and we put it to a way that we marketed it to a certain manner, and we brung the flow. Once we brung the flow, that's when everybody started paying attention for it. And that's when the wolves start coming out. To, and then we got to shoot the wolf unless he's one of our. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Um, did you feel like after all of this, now you doing legit business? Do you still feel like maybe you look over your shoulder? Like maybe maybe old enemies out there that you still might have to think about? Um, and before I go further, I know you see me keep going like this. And then I try to listen and sit to what you're saying and shit, because I ain't hearing that good like, as I did before. So every time I go like that, it's to hear what you say. But um, as far as um, old enemies, you know, I, I don't have no old enemies personally. Um, um, everybody that that this side to me, you know what I'm saying? That shit been dealt with. These these people are not around. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't say that to brag or try. It's just a fact. That's it. Um, as far as being vigilant, of course, got to be vigilant. But then again, look, I got a shop on a hundred on my block. Like, so it wasn't, it ain't really like I'm worrying about too much. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Because I got a fucking, I'm sitting here on the block every fucking day. You know what I mean? Of course, we're not just going to be sitting here like, oh, and leaving it all up to God. Because, you know, from my understanding, God say, help yourself and we'll help you. And I'll help you. Help yourself and I'll help you. So we definitely going to take the proper precaution and have everything in place. Just in course, in case somebody do some dumb shit and try to jump out the window for whatever reason, you know what I mean? But it ain't because of something that I did. I'm not sitting here just, you know, telling everybody, y'all niggas got to take me or whatever. Now nah, I'm chilling here because I know that I don't got no problems with nobody, no one that has done nothing to me. I haven't done nothing to no one out here. So there's no reason for us to have a problem. Whether you like me or don't like me, that's your problem. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? As long as you don't disrespect me and violate my personal space, everything good. Other than that, yeah, um, we definitely always going to be vigilant, but as far as being too worried, no, nah, not too worried. Uh, let's just let's say that um, there's a 13, 14, or 15-year-old boy out there who might watch this interview. Yeah. And maybe he need some new Easter clothes to impress that girl down the block. And he thinking about doing some of the same thing you did when you were 13 or 14. What advice would you give to that 13, 14-year-old boy or girl? That was more or less in the same situation as me. Yes. Just chill, relax. Next year, you got another Easter and if shorty really feeling you, she's going to accept you for who you are. If she don't, then fuck that. Wait till next year. You're going to be 14. If mom Duke ain't got it, you're going to be in position to get a job legitimately on your own on the summer youth program. And that's basically it. You know what I mean? You push forward. But don't you sell, yeah. don't sell yourself for an outfit right now because that's basically what you start doing is selling yourself. For, for for material gain. And I mean the, the people like to glamorize the story, 
because so much hurt and pain came behind that. You did time behind what you did. You lost friends behind what you did. Certain families was destroyed, whether they was your ops or whether it was people in your own crew, their families got destroyed behind that. And I know that that's something that you really like to stress, which is probably one part of the reason why we're doing this interview with you sitting into inside this legitimate shop. We talked about this in the pre-interview. You really wanted to put that message out there that you don't want to glamorize and glorify the street lifestyle, the violence and the drugs. So as, as we end the interview, if there's anything else that you want to drop off to the people, the floor is yours. Um. Hopefully, you know, if one of them young kids that's running around, they see this shit, they could get something and realize, like, listen, man, we don't got to go that route to make our dreams pop. Just have the patience and put in that due diligence. Anything worth having in life doesn't come easy. You got to put that work in. I've learned that as time goes on. Other than that, I want to thank you for your time, man, and giving me the opportunity to speak on your platform and um, and um, talk to you about my new ventures. Um as far as the new ventures to, 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 to add on to that, like we got the West Side Boutique. You can follow the page at westsideboutique.com. Um, We're in Manhattan. We got a bunch of stuff. If you got any independent designers or any independent artists, they could reach out. We could probably place their merchandise and, you know, push it and, you know, generate funds for them so they can continue to do what they do. And um, whoever want to follow me, um, you can go to Titon Rose Valley. And IG, the Don't Roll the Valley Facebook, and um, the Don't Roll the Valley everywhere. Or you can go to Guala Life and find us. Other than that, man, um, everybody be safe, man. Stay focused and patience, man. Patience. He don't. Thank, thank you so much for uh, g- giving us your time. When Next time I'm in NYC, I'm going to stop by the shop, bring a camera with me so we can get some more footage. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And I'll walk you through. I'll walk you through the hood and all that. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. But, Definitely come through, man. Whenever you're in the city, man, you're more than welcome to come through. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, Titone.